uh, very good morning to everybody. We have with us a very distinguished scientist from Nimhans, Dr. Palguni Anand Alladi, Madam. Uh, at the outset, I welcome you, Madam, for this presentation. We have with us our esteemed uh, KSTA member, Dr. Ambekar Ekna, sir. On behalf of all of you, I welcome, sir. Sir, welcome to you, sir. Ekna, sir, welcome to you. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. I welcome all the senior academicians, young teaching faculty and students who have joined for this webinar. Uh, I also welcome Dr. Bharat Srinivas. Most probably he may be joining shortly. Uh, with this, I would like to introduce Dr. Palguni Anand, madam, to all the participants present here. Dr. Palguni, madam, is a senior scientific officer in the Department of Clinical Psychopharmacology and uh, Neurotoxicology of the prestigious uh, National Institute of Mental Health and uh, Neurosciences, Bangalore. She was a, a Gujarat University topper during her master's in microbiology and uh, later pursued her PhD at the most prestigious All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi, on how music helps the developing brain. Her current research focuses on brain aging and Parkinson's disease. Her core research question is to understand why an individual is more likely to develop Parkinson's disease and why another is not. She has many national and international publications to her credit. Her articles have been featured on international slides, sites like uh, Science Trends. She has received many prestigious awards, including International Parkinson's and uh, uh, Movement Disasters, Disorders Society, USA, Professor Surinder Mohan Marwa Award of uh, ICMR, and also Dr. A. Namashivayam Award in 2019 of the Indian Association of Biomedical Scientists. She has recent she she was recently elected as a, a member of uh, the National Academy of Medical Sciences. On behalf of uh, KSTA, congratulations to you, Madam. She has collaborations with Indian and international faculty. She is also a visiting professor in Goethe University, Frankfurt, Germany. With this brief background, I request Madam to take over and deliver her talk. Over to you, Madam. Thank you very much, sir, for the kind introduction. And uh, thank, I'm extremely grateful to the Academy for giving me this opportunity to interact with the youngsters. And uh, uh, I hope that my laboratory will be a platform for the students to um, come and see what we are practically doing uh, at NIMHANS. I do have visitors, visiting students under the student, uh, the summer research fellowship program of the Indian Academy of Sciences wherein every year uh, two students uh, two three students come and visit my lab and spend around uh, two to three months with me so um, once again i thank you and uh, this uh, particular this the first slide shows uh, uh, the building where our laboratories are housed this is the second floor of the so-called admin block of nimhans and uh, this is where our laboratories are housed so we will be um, discussing certain neurobiological aspects of Parkinson's disease. So in uh, at many instances, maybe I'd be speak, uh, calling it PD and not Parkinson's disease. So uh, mind my familiarity, uh, sorry about the familiarity uh, with the word. So uh, we'd like to uh, cruise you through the history of Parkinson's disease, the definition, the role of dopamine, what is movement, uh, what is the neuropathology of Parkinson's disease, the mechanisms involved in the disease, the risk factors, genetics, stem cells, so on and so forth. Yeah. So when we <laughs> learn about any um, field in this particular era, we know that we can see further only because we are standing on the shoulders of the giants. In our context, in terms of Parkinson's disease, 
ancient medicine has offered us the platform. Say Ayurveda has first described Kampavada, which is the synonym for Parkinson's disease. And that was described more than 5,000 years ago. It has a mention in the Charak Samhita and the, uh, the treatment for it was the powdered form of mucuna purins, the cowhage beans, which is a natural source of L-dopa. And it has uh, today found uh, space in the clinical trials, even in Western literature. The la later on, Chinese texts seem to have mentioned it somewhere around 425 BC, and they also have some traditional anti-tremor pills, which are still in use. Greece and even later Rome has documented the uh, occurrence of Parkinson's disease in some cases, and in this case, it was the famous King Nestor who suffered from these typical symptoms of Parkinson's disease and hence was not allowed to compete in the athletic events. Gallen in 175 AD uh, has mentioned about the tremor, palpitations, convulsions, and shivering, which were close to the description of Parkinson's disease in that era, which was also followed by uh, which was preceded by Byzantine period. Now, if we come to modern medicine, we know about the great uh, English surgeon, uh, James Parkinson, who wrote the uh, essay on the shaking palsy. He was, in addition to being a surgeon, he was a great paleontologist and has some fossils named under him. We often come across this particular photograph of James Parkinson as the Parkinson, who described Parkinson's disease, but unfortunately, he's not the right Parkinson. There is no face actually or no photograph available of Parkinson's, James Parkinson, and hence, when we come across this photograph in literature, we should take it with caution. Coming to uh, the, sec the second most important uh, neurologist who described or who contributed to the etymology of Parkinson's disease is Dr. Jean Martin Charcot, who has, uh, who was the first uh, neurologist to describe uh, multiple sclero sclerosis, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis as a separate uh, disease, also about Charcot's joints and charcot Marie Tooth disease. But he was gregarious enough to accept that the patients who presented with the shaking palsy syn syndromes were actually first identified by James Parkinson and hence called it the malady de Parkinson or Parkinson's disease. He was also the one who identified that symptoms that are in reality nothing but the cry from suffering organs, giving an importance to the history collection from the patient. A very brief uh, description about Parkinson's disease. That is, that's the second most common neurodegenerative disorder with a median age of onset of around 60 years. And more than 6.3 million people were suffering till uh, 2005 when this report was submitted. Uh, estimated crude prevalence is around 160 per 100,000 as per WHO uh, reports. And uh, what is important is that Parkinson's disease prevalence differs significantly between populations based on ethnicity, genetics, and environment. The modern day uh, definition of Parkinson's disease says it's a disease that is characterized by the classical features of tremor, rigidity, and bradykinesia with impaired balance. The onset is slow and deficits are usually asymmetric. The uh, Hallmark feature is the presence of Levy bodies, which are usually found in the substantia nigra pars compacta or zona compacta, and the neuronal loss predominates in this region, particularly within the ventrolateral tier of the substantia nigra. So if you look at uh, uh, the clinical definition of Parkinson's disease and a classical patient, you would see a stooped posture, uh, shuffling gait. So the major symptoms Clinical symptoms are bradykinesia, tremor, rigidity, postural instability, and the diagnosis is invariably based on clinical examination and a supportive clinical history. So, uh, in addition to the clinical symptoms, there are uh, con evolving concepts that some other features, uh, some other non-motor features precede the motor symptoms, and a few genetic aspects are involved. So in current literature, movement disorder or Parkinson's disease is 
much more than a movement disorder. It is called a movement disorder because it's associated with walking, uh, associated problems and uh, making movements, general movements of hands and uh, legs, etc. So if we um, look at the deficits that are present in different um, parts of the brain as well as the body, one would see that within the brain, if, uh, the patient would have some uh, manifestations of cognitive deficits, dementia, visual hallucination, depression, apathy. Uh, other aspects of the uh, disease include shoulder pain, stiffness, diplopia, the, uh, blurred vision, as well as uh, reduced olfaction, which is a major primary uh, prodromal syndrome. In addition, there are cardiac autonomic dysfunctions. Uh, there is reduced gastric emptying, which leads to uh, constipation. Intestinal motility is affected. Urinary frequency and urgency is affected, as well as there is uh, reproductive as well as erectile dysfunction. So, one would uh, from the previous slide, one would uh, feel that you know there is kind of a madness because there are so many symptoms that the patient has, but there is a method to this madness. So if you look at the progression, so on this graph where the pathology is scored on zero to hundred in an increasing order this way, and with progressing age or the progress in the disease uh, manifestation, one would see that it. Um, in the initial 20 year, uh, 15 to 20 years, patients are generally asymptomatic. Um, in the preceding decade, they sh start showing symptoms of constipation as well as anosmia, as well as subsequently, there are the symptoms of sleep disorders. And they proceed, as we see, uh, uh, precede the motor symptoms. And they are also with increasing age and increase uh, with the progressive disease, they become uh, even more, <clears throat> even more intense and worrisome. One of the major symptoms um, about Parkinson's uh, as a prodromal symptom of Parkinson's disease is the olfaction. So normally it was believed that uh, human olfaction is uh, highly compromised and we cannot, but that is not the truth uh, because we have a proper uh, olfactory system which is housed inside uh, the brain and the nasal cavity. Uh, so in Parkinson's disease, one would see uh, the damaged olfactory and sheathing glia, the olfactory epithelium is damaged and is compromised. Dopamine is the next major uh, aspect of Parkinson's disease. And as we all know, dopamine in, uh, uh, in um, collaboration with norepinephrine as well as serotonin, they contribute to these transmitters, neurotransmitters contribute to several normal processes of the um, of uh, human behavior. And uh, dopamine per se is involved in maintaining the balance, pleasure, pain avoidance, etc. In uh, collaboration with norepinephrine, it is involved in again balance, novelty seeking, motivation, and with serotonin, it is involved. Uh, it is it modulates um, satiety, uh, in, inhibition of overeating, pl neural plasticity, uh, sexual responses, etc. And a small brief description of movement for people who are not initiated into the movement disorders. So movement is produced and coordinated by motor cortex, basal ganglia, and cerebellum. So these are the three different important regions of the brain that coordinate and gen. Uh, generate movement. Now, sensory nervous system, as well as the information that is available of, on the speed, as well as positioning of the body parts, as well as the spinal motor neurons, coordinate the muscle contraction that is outside the brain. So basically, motor cortex sends electrical signals that are initiated by the upper motor neurons through the basal ganglia contract and then resulting in the movement. Now, where do, where do basal ganglia feature over here? So both cerebellum and motor cortex, they send information to the basal ganglia. So basal ganglia uh, happens to be the modulating sector. So within the basal ganglia, which is a collection of five different uh, nuclei within uh, the brain, um, certain regions facilitate movement and cert certain others inhibit the movement. But a balance is essential. And in cases of disruption of the basal ganglia, one may see the occurrence of Parkinson's disease or Huntington's disease or many other disorders like the balancing dystonia or tremors and tics. 
So there is a, an um, inherent connectivity between the different regions of the basal ganglia. So these are known as pathways, which are responsible for the motor circuits. They have a certain composition during normal conditions. Say from the cortex, the uh, projections are received by the putamen. Now the putamen also, which is considered to be the motor striatum, motor aspect of striatum, which also receives connections from the uh, substantia nigra pass compacta, which sends dopaminergic inputs to the putamen, which is received by the D1 and D2 receptor holding uh, uh, um, multiple spiny, uh, medium spiny neurons. So under uh, disease conditions, say in Parkinson's disease, because the neurons are lost in this particular region, that is the substantia nigra pass compacta, these signals are weakened. In that case, putamen, which has uh, which has inhibitory actions, inhibitory role, send, uh, uh, is ex excessively inhibited. It sends inhibitory signals to the globus pallidus externum, which reduces its inhibition on the subthalamic nucleus. That again gets, because it's an excitatory nucleus, it gets, it ex sends excitatory signals to the GP uh, interna and the subst uh, substantia nigra reticulator. Now, both these are negative or inhibitory in nature, because of which there is excess inhibition reaching back to the cortex, <clears throat> resulting in the symptoms of uh, freezing of gait or uh, inhibition uh, or akinesia. So now coming to the different risk factors, which as um, Professor Ramesh mentioned, my interest has been on the different uh, aspects of susceptibility. So I would um, like to introduce you to the risk factors that are found in the occurrence of blood of Parkinson's disease. So as listed over here, age and gender, middle age obesity, lack of exercise, Rural living, well water ingestion, and environmental toxins, they all club together and have a common feature in the background, which is the, um, which is the seepage of pesticides into the environment. Uh, genetic inheritance is known in 10 to 15% of the cases, and ethnicity is one more risk factor. So now explaining how age and gender affect the um, prevalence of Parkinson's disease. So here, as we see, there is an increase in the cases of Parkinson's disease with increase in age. As you can see here, this is the uh, increasing age order. And the number of male uh, Parkinson's disease patients is generally, in most cases, higher compared to the female Parkinson's disease case. Uh, cases, barring Korea and Japan, where there is a female preponderance. Now, if you look at uh, genetics of Parkinson's disease, the uh, the studies that have come forward to describe the genetic involvement in Parkinson's disease can be roughly divided into pre-2005 and post-2005. So, pre-2005 uh, was the pre-GVAS area, uh, era, that is the genome-wide association study era, when uh, these genes, the mono, uh, genes were described like the uh, alpha synuclein or the parking, the LARP2, uh, the DJ1, the glucocerebrosidase um, A, and the pink one. So these uh, contributed to the understanding that Parkinson's disease may have a single gene origin, and hence it is known as monog monogenic uh, onset or monogenic influence. Whereas subsequently, because of the GVA study, several other genes have been identified. Now, amongst the most interesting uh, genes that have come into forefront of Parkinson's disease result research is the alpha synuclein gene. So this was the first study which was described in 1997, uh, where they saw that a huge number of family members, which are uh, these uh, squares and circles that you see, which are colored, are the individuals who were affected by Parkinson's disease. So this is in the same kindred, around 16, 17 page, uh, subjects were affected. Um, so was the case with another kindred. So um, if we look at uh, the different genes, the monogenic uh, um, associated genes, in that case, one can say that 
genes are associated generally with early onset Parkinson's disease, and they account to almost 15% of the cases uh, of uh, this disease. And in the late onset disease, generally it is sporadic in nature. That means it may not have an active genetic component or may not have uh, been identified until now. So, as I mentioned before, familial PD is associated with uh, mutations in the Parkin, PINK1, BJ1, LERC2, and uh, SNCA, whereas the LERC2 and in certain cases, Parkin and PINK1 are also associated with sporadic Parkinson's disease. Several animal models have been thereby, thereby devised to understand Parkinson's disease, and uh, several aspects have been covered. And in case of conditional Parkin uh, mutation, homozygous knockout, one could see that there was a Parkinson-like phenotype seen at 10 minutes, 10 months after injection. Similarly, uh, some other uh, genes like the DJ1, PINK1, LERC2, and alpha synuclein have been um, observed, have been studied, and uh, alpha synuclein has sh been shown to um, have major, uh, have, have been shown to show Parkinson's like symptoms in these animal models. So, which are the processes that are affected in case of uh, monogenic Parkinson's disease? That is, does one gene affect one aspect or it, are there multiple aspects that are affected? So, one would see that Parkinson's BJ1 are associated with mitochondrial dysfunction, LERC2, VPS35, uh, DNAJC1, and SYNGEN1. They are associate with, uh, associated with the synaptic release of the proteins, whereas um, uh, the FX07 uh, and GBA as well as ATP13A2 is associated with protein degradation. And again, we come across uh, alpha synuclein as a major um, uh, factor, major uh, genetic uh, factor which moves either way. Okay, so now um, we'll try to understand the neuropathology of Parkinson's disease, a brief description about that. So if you look at the anatomy of a uh, human brain, so this is the, this is the forebrain uh, and um, the, uh, this aspect becomes the frontal cortex and just around the lateral ventricles, you find the caudate nucleus, which is associate, which is uh, generally associated with the emotional aspects of the striatum, a striatal function. And here you have the putamen. Then uh, adjacent to the putamen towards the medial side is the uh, globus pallidus externa and globus pallidus interna. And ventral to uh, that is the subthalamic nucleus. Substantia nigra pass compactor is located in the midbrain. So it's technically slightly away, but it is still nevertheless considered as a part of the basal ganglia. And as mentioned earlier in uh, Parkinson's disease, the uh, connections from the substantia nigra to the putamen are affected. And generally within the substantia nigra neuron, one would find uh, these kind of deposits, which are known as levy bodies. On radiology, uh, fluorodopa PET shows good signal intensity and color signal here in an, under normal conditions, whereas the signals weaken because of the loss of dopamine within the putamen. So um, the putamen is uh, generally more affected in Parkinson's disease, and these are a uh, few more cases. So there are several mechanisms which have been designated to cause uh, Parkinson's disease. Um, one primary uh, cause is considered to be associated with dopamine. So dopamine oxidation leads to um, transient effects on alpha synuclein, and um, uh, the formation of the Levy bodies, which causes, which increases the toxicity to the neurons, leads them to neuronal death. Mitochondrial dysfunction is one major uh, cause. Similarly, the compromised ubiquitin pro proteasome system also contributes to the disease condition. But if one would, um, yeah, so if one would have a closer look at the number of mechanisms that are affected by alpha synuclein, there are one third of the mechanisms which are uh, badly debilitated in Parkinson's disease. So how does alpha synuclein become pathogenic? Now it is present in the brain, so it must have some normal function. 
So here one can see that under normal condition, the alpha synuclein uh, protein is present in a random coil kind of a structure, which is a native alpha synuclein. Now, when there is some kind of an insult, uh, this protein becomes misfolded. When it gets misfolded, the chaperons and other proteins, they try to uh, refold them. But in certain cases, if it is beyond repair, then they are tagged to the phagosomes or the lysosomes and they are targeted for autophagy or they are targeted for degradation through the proteasome, ubiquitin proteasome pathway. In the event that this uh, degradation does not take place and they move forward, they come on, they uh, go on to form oligomers, which are the beta pleated sheets, and further uh, amyloid beta kind of fibers, beta pleated sheets, which then cause several uh, distress uh, inducing processes within the cell, which include oxidative stress, protein sequestration, disruption of oxon axonal transport, synaptic dysfunction, inhibition of the ubiquitin proteasome pathways I mentioned, and mitochondrial dysfunction. In this process, um, they form fiber like structures and uh, Levy body kind structures, and they're present either in the in the neurites or within the cell body. Now, when they are released within the environment or within the niche of that uh, particular cell, they are taken up by the adjacent cells, which are which then become infected. So these are uh, the um, different types of uh, staining protocols which are used to detect ubiquitin positive bodies. Now, this brings us to the importance of alpha synuclein in several other aspects. So this was uh, first proposed by Professor Heiko Brach, who discussed the importance of alpha synuclein expression in progression of uh, Parkinson's disease pathology. And this is a intact, this is a um, whole brain, um, this is a part of a huge brain, uh, chunk of a brain structure, which, is stay, uh, which has been sectioned into 100 micron thick sections and then stained by immunohistochemistry to um, form um, to identify the expression of alpha synuclein and the modifications, if any. So he is responsible for describing the itinerary and roadmap of alpha synuclein. And let us see how. So we talked about the prodromal pre-symptomatic phase as well as the symptomatic phase. Now here we must understand that because Parkinson's disease is considered as a movement disorder, it is often um, uh, said to be diagnosed with the onset of motor symptoms, right? That is why before the onset of the motor symptoms, it is always considered as a pre-symptomatic phase. And as you see, alpha synuclein positive bodies were present in the dorsal motor nucleus of vagus and the locus cereus early on. And they keep on increasing with age and uh, progression of the disease pathogenesis. Their expression increases. And as we can see over here, there is a spread from the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus to the locus ceruleus to the substantia nigra. This is when the motor symptoms are manifested. Thereafter, it's the mesocortex, neocortex association area, and the neocortex primary plus secondary. So, Brach was the one who um, fundamentally proposed that there are two hits which occur in case of uh, the pathology and proposed it to be the dual hit hypothesis, wherein he said that the first set of um, alpha synuclein positive bodies are seen in the, either in the olfactory bulb or within the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus, and then they spread within the brain. And so describing a little more academic aspect of this, in the first stage, as we saw, olfactory bulb, anterior olfactory nucleus of the dorsal motor nuclei of vagus are affected. Second stage is the pons. Third stage is the pentopon. Uh, third and fourth stage is the peduncular pontine nucleus, cholinergic magnocellular nuclei, as well as appearance of the first clinical symptoms of Parkinson's disease, which thereafter um, uh, worsen and uh, in at stage five, neocortical higher order association areas are um, involved. So there are many other studies uh, subsequently have shown the, um, the presence of alpha synuclein resulting in the loss of uh, dopaminergic neurons and the formation of Levy bodies. And uh, these are uh, the alpha synuclein positive bodies in different regions um, of the, um, of the um, 
uh, vagal nerve and uh, different stages of the um, uh, nervous system, their involvement. And this is, again, recollection of the uh, pathway that the alpha synuclein follows to reach the neocortex. So that brings along the importance of vagus nerve. Now, vagus nerve is important because that's the one which connects the brain to the rest of the viscera, the digestive system. So from the dorsal motor nucleus of vagus, you have connections all the way to the stomach and the pancreas. So they tend to carry the alpha synuclein prion as a prion molecule uh, up to the uh, dorsal motor nu uh, nucleus of the vagus and further into the brain. Now, this has been experimentally proved in mice where um, these, uh, this is a normal C57 black 6 mice and uh, they have used exogenously formed preformed pre fibrils. So, when uh, these PFF are allowed to incubate with endogenous uh, alpha synuclein, they form the, path form the pathological form of alpha synuclein. So, um, under normal condition, when they are injected, uh, in the uh, myentric plexus of the, uh, of, uh, of the mice, the alpha synuclein progresses to reach the brain and causes Parkinsonian symptoms. Whereas if there is a vagotomy, that is the vagus nerve is cut, then the mice does not develop Parkinson's disease. And similar is the case with mice which have uh, alpha synuclein deletion. So that means they do not have access to endogenous alpha synuclein which keeps them in the um, oligomer form. So now that was, that uh, that uh, basic basic science study led to a clinical uh, examination of um, retrospective examination of data that was available from uh, vagotomy cases and uh, in Sweden. And what they compared was uh, in the cases of vagotomy, what was the uh, incidence of Parkinson's disease, and uh, they found that when there was a truncal vagotomy, the in the uh, rather the cases. Um, uh, of Parkinson, uh, the cases, uh, the patients, sorry, who had truncal vagotomy had much lower incidence of Parkinson's disease. So the number of patients who were suffering, um, uh, if they had be undergone vagotomy, fewer patients would be uh, positive for Parkinson's disease. So in this case, uh, they have um, analyzed the data for three different um, vagotomy procedures, that's the trunkal vagotomy, whether it is severed at the trunk uh, or the total selective gastric and uh, to higher, the proximal vagotomy, in which case, in these cases, the Parkinson's disease cases with um, frequency was not affected. So now this suggests that the brain and the gut is absolutely well connected. And there are several reports which have emerged in recent times that it is the gut microbiome which um, in the health of the gut microbiome, which decides the health of the brain, and Parkinson's disease case is um, disease um, is one such uh, interesting cohort where they have seen that um, uh, a certain um, a certain uh, type of uh, bacteria uh, are more uh, are more in number or in abundant in the Parkinson's disease cases vis-a-vis -vis the um, control subjects. So how would uh, uh, um, how would alpha synuclein travel from one cell to another cell? So this is what we see from um, this. Uh, we learn from this slide. Here one can see that uh, whenever there is some kind of a cellular injury and uh, the alpha synuclein leaks out, it can be picked up by the transmembrane uh, mode through the via the transmembrane portals, or it could be. Um, Endos uh, so once it is exocytosed, it can be endocytosed as well. So this is thrown out and this is taken up by a surrounding cell. And um, it is also packaged into exosomes and released in form of vesicles, which are, which are then taken up by another adjacent uh, cell. And then they become pathogenic. There are uh, reports where uh, the um, nanotube formation has been observed or even transsynaptic. Uh, accumulation and uh, transfer has been observed. So this has again been um, proven in human subjects. So uh, this is the paper where um, 
they have uh, studied the effect of alpha synuclein transfer or rather possibility of alpha synuclein transfer in transplant cases so these were um, parkinson's disease patients who were refractory to the disease and then they were um, transplanted with uh, embryonic ventral mesencephalon into the post commissural putamen and then uh, the patient survived for 14 years and died a natural death and they uh, examined the brain and they found that um, uh, the, uh, the grafts or the transplants were active so they were performing just that they did not have that receptor but these transplants were full of alpha synuclein positive either levy neurites or levy bodies suggesting that uh, even though they were from the fetal uh, age right so where uh, they're supposed to be fresh but uh, the alpha synuclein which was present in the um, in the uh, host pathogenic tissue was able to migrate to the was able to migrate to the healthy tissue a uh, similar uh, transfer of pathology has been indicated in tau protein and uh, in case of patients. So here one can see a tau positive. Now, um, the, one of the risk factors, as I mentioned earlier, is midlife obesity. And uh, exercise is supposed, is, uh, supposed to be um, both useful in preventing as well as reducing the symptoms that are seen by the Parkinson's disease patients. And this slide lists out all the neuropsychiatric, autonomic, and sleep disorders. Those who are interested can, um, uh, can go through these uh, reviews. If you look at the treatment, which will be a brief description of treatment, is based on the normal physiology of uh, the synapse. That is, uh, we know that tyrosine is converted to L-dopa, which forms dopamine, and then that is uh, uh, packaged into vesicles and is released. So amantadine is uh, involved in stimulation of dopamine release and it inhibits reuptake. So that way uh, the dopamine would be present for a longer time in the synaptic cleft and will be able to um, will be able to stimulate the postsynaptic uh, receptors. And, uh, uh, one also finds dopamine agonists. Um, then uh, selagilin inhibits the MAUB. Uh, uh, levels, it reduces the MAUB levels, levodopa is the gold standard treatment which is available for Parkinson's disease and is amongst the most effective ones even today. So there are, there are several uh, medications which are available in different uh, brand names and uh, their properties are uh, well understood. Uh, in cases of refractory uh, Parkinson's disease, uh, surgical procedures have been performed to provide uh, symptomatic relief to the patients, and these include thalamotomy, pallidotomy, thalamic stimulation, or deep brain stimulation. So deep brain stimulation, which is uh, amongst the most popular ones, is uh, can be done in the globus pallidus interna, the subthalamic nucleus, the pedunculopontine nucleus, etc. And uh, the thalamic stimulation is effective only for tremor. So there are several combinations which are generally worked out, uh, and these are decided on the basis of the patient's uh, symptoms. Although the mechanisms are unclear, it is believed that uh, there is a depolarization blockade following which the electrical currents, uh, they block the neuronal output near the electrode site. And they also um, are involved in synaptic inhibition. There are several non-medication therapies which have been uh, which have been proposed, including uh, physical therapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy, and other modalities like Ayurveda, music therapy, art, recreation, etc. Now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, prevalence of Parkinson's disease differs in different ethnic populations. And this is a meta-analysis which was uh, conducted uh, reading the studies which were conducted in Asia, Europe, and South America. And one finds that the incidence of Parkinson's disease is much lower in Asia compared to Europe and South America. So 
that clarifies the observation that ethnic factors play an important role in epidemiology of Parkinson's disease. And uh, this is a map to make it easier. The non-white populations, non-white countries have much lower uh, prevalence compared to the Caucasian um, dominated countries. Now, in India, if we look at uh, the prevalence of Parkinson's disease, again, it is much lower as is described in the international literature, barring the uh, Parsis, um, who we know are genetically distinct population. So this uh, question intrigued me that why is this, uh, uh, why is the prevalence um, so distinctly different in um, as, uh, and is based on ethnicity and what could be the neurobiological reason for that? So uh, my mentor, Dr. Uday Muthane had uh, initially proposed that um, it may be associated with the number of substantia nigra neurons within the midbrain, because we know that substantia nigra is the region where the neurons are lost that results in the loss of dopamine in the um, striatum. Now, the other factor which we know is that Parkinson's disease is an age-related disorder. So um, there would be, uh, under even under normal conditions during normal aging, there would be a loss of dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra. So that had been reported in the Western literature. And when we compare that with uh, our uh, studies, um, the Indian population showed no loss of dopaminergic neurons in their in the substantia nigra pass compactor. And when we compare uh, these two populations, it is seen that the number of dopaminergic neurons, though being less, is uh, the uh, symptoms are, uh, sorry, the nigra is still protected and preserved. So what we did was, um, there was a gap of around 10 or 15 years, and so we needed to revalidate those findings. So we um, utilized, uh, we employed some specific and very um, high-end techniques called uh, stereology, and we counted the number of dopaminergic neurons that were present in the substantia nigra pass compactor of aging human population. These are samples that are collected, brain samples that are collected at autopsy, because many um, individuals who uh, either die of road traffic accident or non neurological uh, consequences do donate uh, their brains for uh, research purposes to the human brain tissue repository that is located in the, um, it, that is uh, housed in the pathology department of our institute. So we studied uh, the NIGRA from different uh, in, uh, individuals of different age groups. And as we see over here, there is uh, this black pigment which is present is the pig, uh, pigment called neuromelanin, which is responsible for the dark, um, uh, which is responsible for that, uh, that particular color which is seen um, in the, in the, in the midbrain um, of any normal individual. This is a non-melanized neuron. So we counted them and we found that there was no loss of nigral neurons with age. So um, we compared our findings with uh, those studies uh, which were reported using similar techniques in international literature. And we found that in the Caucasian population, there was an age-related loss which was absent in our cohort as well as in a French study. Now, although French are Caucasians, they do have a much lower prevalence of Parkinson's disease. So this kind of uh, um, confirmed our our uh, our hypothesis that it is the age-related cell loss which may um, be a risk factor for Parkinson's disease. We then looked at the expression of GDNF receptors because GDNF is the, uh, is the neurotrophic factor that supports the survival of dopaminergic neurons, and we found that they were well-preserved in these neurons. We found that there was an increase in the ubiquitin-positive Marinesco bodies, and as we know, it is involved in the ubiquitin proteasome pathway. So we proposed that uh, there is some kind of subthreshold degeneration that is taking place within the substantia nigra neurons. And uh, thereafter, we had to look at the glia, and we found that the number of glia was, stand, uh, was stable, but they underwent some kind of morphological transformation leading to uh, the neurotoxic elements within the niche area. 
Uh, so um, it uh, same was the case with astrocytes as well as microglia. So if we compare the findings from Asian Indians and Caucasians, we find that there is some kind of subthreshold neurodegeneration in Asian Indians, whereas there is um, exaggerated neurodegeneration with age in the Caucasians. Now, that brought us to an interesting finding about um, the incidence of Parkinson's disease in Anglo-Indians. And as we know, Anglo-Indians are the first generation crossbreds of, uh, are the first generation offsprings of um, the English, uh, the Brit, or the uh, Caucasian, uh, the colonial Caucasians and the Indians. And when we look at the incidence of Parkinson's disease in this population, it is much more lower than even Indians. So they are much better protected. So that kind of uh, intrigued us even more. And we wanted to study the reasons or the neurobiological reasons behind it. And hence, we looked at an animal model. We, uh, we thought about uh, designing an animal model. And uh, amongst the animal models that are available for Parkinson's disease, in addition to uh, the rotenone injected or 6-hydroxydopamine injected neurotoxin models, MPTP is supposed to be um, a very popular one. And that has its genesis in the finding of um, uh, uh, finding of Dr. Uh, William Langston, who proposed that the, uh, MPTP was the reason for uh, the, exp uh, the Parkinsonian symptoms that he saw in the so-called frozen addicts. Right, so MPTP uh, is basically uh, like phyllic compound. It cr crosses the blood-brain barrier and is taken up by the glia, converted to MPP+, plus and is released within the niche, which is then taken up by the nerve terminals, uh, at the nerve terminals of the dopaminergic neurons. And uh, once they are taken up by the nerve terminals, they go to this, uh, they migrate to the cell body and affect the mitochondrial complexes, the synaptic vesicles and enzymes to cause Parkinsonian symptoms. So now a brief recollect of uh, the, uh, the <clears throat> Uh, background of the study. So we know that Caucasians have higher prevalence of Parkinson's disease and subsequent studies had shown that they had lower number of migraine neurons, whereas in the Asian Indians, it was opposite. And the case is not clear with Anglo-Indians. So we designed an animal model where we used a C57 black 6 mouse, which has higher susceptibility to Parkinson's disease with lower number of migraine neurons and um, uh, and cross them against uh, CD1 white mice, which had lower susceptibility to MPTP and had much more uh, nigral neurons. So these are the animals that I'm talking about. This is a C57, this is the CD1 mouse, and these are the crossbreds. So when we looked at uh, their normal uh, substantial nigra, we found that the numbers were indeed less in the C57 black 6 and more in the protected strains. And when they are challenged with MPTP, there is a loss of nigral dopaminergic neurons in the C57 black 6, whereas the crossbreds are completely protected, thereby providing proof of uh, our hypothesis and showed that there was no uh, apoptosis present in these crossbreds again. Uh, the caspases and uh, apoptosis have an inherent connect connection, and we found that, uh, in fact, in the crossbreds, the caspase expression went uh, down, it declined after uh, being injected with MPTP. So it is possible that uh, there is uh, some kind of neuroprotective mechanism that comes into action. And so is the case of dopamine. There is a reduction in C57 black 6, but there is no alteration in the F1, X2, that is the crossbred mice. And that was supplemented by increase in the GDNF expression in these mice. So that shows that uh, they, uh, they up their neurotrophic pot, uh, potential to survive the uh, toxic onslaught. Again, uh, when we, uh, when we uh, measured the striatal local field potentials, we found that the parent strain showed imbalance in activity, whereas it was much better preserved in the crossbreds. And uh, they again up their potential by expressing, overexpressing a uh, calbinin protein, which is a calcium binding protein that takes care of calcium induced excitotoxicity in the um, dopaminergic neurons. 
So they also showed better behavior. That is, um, when we tested them on the rotor rod, um, uh, rotor rod ensemble, we found that the C57 black six were quick to fall. So they could not uh, retain their grip and could not continue on the rotating rod. Whereas the FNX2 and FNX1 were uh, performing persistently better. And again, they had much better grip strength in their forelimbs. And the mitochondrial complexes were also preserved. So we then looked at uh, the mitochondrial proteins, which is the dynamin related protein one, which is associated with uh, fission of the mitochondria and fusion associated protein hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase one, which um, was kind of upregulated in uh, the CD1 white mice. So, um, that kind of told us that uh, the mitochondria are probably programmed differently or they behave differently in response to a neurotoxic challenge. Uh, so the best way to look at uh, the mitochondria was by electron microscopy. And we found that uh, the C57 black six mice when injected with NPTP had fragmented small mitochondria, whereas the mitochondria in the C57, the CD1 were better preserved. However, astrocytes showed a different behavior in the sense that uh, they showed larger mitochondria after MPTP challenge and which may um, explain the, why the astrocytes are better protected and they kind of uh, flagrate the neuroinflammatory cycle and they uh, have a persistent neuroinflammatory phenotype. So the next question which we wanted to ask was, Yes, um, the FNX2, that is the crossbreds are protected, but when does the neuroprotection set in or are they already developmentally designed? So, so uh, we looked at uh, the developmental uh, pattern of uh, the substantia nigra pass compactor. And here, as you see, the nigra of C57 black 6 is much smaller. Fewer neurons again over here, whereas um, uh, in the protected strains, it, it, the expression was much higher and the end product was a larger substantia nigra pass compactor. So this is to summarize some of these findings that uh, uh, the resilience is actually governed in a multifactorial manner and the neuron interneuron and glia uh, ratio is very um, critical. Uh, we use this uh, animal model to test some small molecules. So as we know, small molecules uh, in my molecular biology and pharmacology tenets is a small uh, is a molecule that is low molecular weight that has a lower molecular weight of less than 900 uh, Daltons and it may regulate some biological processes. So this was a study in collaboration with uh, uh, Professor Ravi Manjitaya from JNCSR. And um, we found that uh, the small molecule that is the six bio compound was uh, able to modulate uh, autophagy uh, even uh, in the presence of MPTP and rescued the symptoms. As you can see over here, the substantia nigra is much better preserved compared to after uh, MPTP injection. There's a loss of uh, nigral neurons and uh, faintly stained substantia nigra. <clears throat> okay, so now. Uh, we have understood major aspects of the pathogenesis of Parkinson's disease and how uh, it uh, discriminates between um, individuals based on several criteria, several risk factors and ethnicity. But is there some way to diagnose uh, Parkinson's disease at an earlier stage? That's what brings us to the importance of uh, biomarker, which is a defined characteristic measured as an indicator of a normal biological process and um, it may change or it may be a good marker to understand the processes or responses of any uh, expo uh, any toxic uh, associated exposure or any um, therapeutic intervention. So there are longitudinal studies where they, people have used uh, known proteins as biomarkers and uh, some have studied uh, uh, some have shown down regulation, some have shown up regulation. So there's some kind of um, loss of consensus over here. Um, there are non-targeted biomarker studies also, which have been reported, which again do not have, uh, do not uh, propose a proper consensus on the outcome. 
So what we did was uh, we studied the CSF of uh, the Parkinson's disease patients, those with uh, without cognitive deficits, some with cognitive deficits, and uh, we did a proteomic studies. We identified around 282 proteins out of which 42 were differentially expressed. And um, these uh, proteins were further validated by ELISA. And we found that fibrinogen and complementary factor H were specifically associated with Parkinson's disease and Parkinson's disease with cognitive impairment. We uh, further evaluated their uh, pathogenic potential using the animal models, using anatomical as well as behavioral correlates. So uh, this brings us to the end of our uh, laboratory-based studies, our uh, studies conducted by our team. But that brings us to an interesting phase where uh, we started looking at literature about how people are um, evaluating uh, the various studies and various uh, aspects of the disease pathogenesis. Like there could be a genetic component, there could be a prodromal component, or um, uh, there could be a neuropathological com component which need, could be studied in detail. So uh, those who are interested in Parkinson's disease uh, research should definitely visit this website, uh, which is the Parkinson's Progression Marker Initiative, where uh, it's a cohort of, um, or rather it's a collective of several uh, investigators across the globe who have come across, come together to look at different aspects of Parkinson's disease and are trying to identify biomarkers that could be um, helpful in, in um, uh, an early diagnosis as well as, main, um, as, well as uh, its usefulness in the uh, prognostication of the disease. Uh, a recent development is the um, identification of uh, different uh, uh, correlates of alpha-synuclein aggregates. So uh, this particular technique where they have used uh, protein misfolding cyclic amplification. So they have amplified the, uh, the um, alpha-synuclein aggregates from different uh, disease patterns. One is the multiple system atrophy, where the um, uh, pathology quickly spreads to several parts of the brain. It begins or it presents in the initial phase as a case of Parkinson's disease, but because of its um, uh, fast progression, uh, it encompasses different areas within the brain and uh, is manif it manifests as multiple system atrophies uh, designated as MSA. Um, so in this study, they found that um, there were structural differences between the alpha synuclein that is seen in the multiple system atrophy case, as you see here, vis a vis a Parkinson's disease case. So, uh, there are interesting observations which have emerged in recent times, uh, which, uh, uh, which are better equipped to explain uh, the progression of the disease as well as diagnostic, uh, diagnosis or prognostication of the disease pattern. So uh, that brings us to an interesting concept of uh, interesting aspect of uh, clinical trials. So um, what are the uh, uh, what are processes are being looked at to um, you know to reduce or reduce the pain and suffering of the Parkinson's disease patients? So this is the website uh, which gives the details of ongoing Parkinson's disease. Uh, clinical trials. And uh, interestingly, in the Indian context, we all know that uh, uh, curcumin is uh, neuroprotective in nature. So there are several um, clinical trials of, on curcu of curcumin on uh, Alzheimer's as well as um, healthy elderly individuals. And in certain cases, they have looked at the motor as well as cognitive symptoms and may hence apply to Parkinson's disease cases. Uh, and these clinical trials are based, as we know, on certain um, basic science studies questions like uh, uh, how would curcumin um, affect, if affect or uh, how does it protect the cells uh, from the devastating effects of, say, a neurotoxin or, um, or, or a neurotoxic insect. So one such uh, study was uh, by the group of uh, Dr. Srinivas Bharat who have studied the bioconjugates of curcumin, and they showed that uh, they are able to protect against the glutathione-depleted uh, oxidative, uh, sorry, 
glutathione depletion mediated oxidative stress so when there is a loss of uh, a reduction in the glutathione that uh, causes um, uh, that uh, results in oxidative stress now in these situations if curcumin is present then it increases again the total uh, glutathione levels and thus rescues the uh, rescues the phenotypic uh, for, um, symptoms so um, how would curcumin interact with alpha synuclein now we know that alpha synuclein is such a spoiling sport in case of parkinson's disease uh, pathophysiology so this study shows that in presence of uh, um, curcumin then alpha synuclein aggregates they um, they tend to uh, they tend to open up and uh, so there is a reduction as so as uh, seen in um, experimental condition so in presence of uh, curcumin the alpha synuclein is unable to generate reactive oxidative stress reactive oxygen species and the oxidative stress so as is seen here there is a reduction in the amount of dcf uh, da uh, the other interesting thing is the clinical efficacy of uh, mucuna prurians, which was again based on the study from Western literature based at King's College London, where they showed, showed improvement in the symptoms in case of uh, Parkinson's disease patients who were, in, uh, who were provided uh, mucuna seed powder. And this is again at a clinical uh, uh, trial stage. There are uh, studies on uh, stem cells, applications of stem cells in Parkinson's disease, and just which was earlier proposed sometime in 2005. And very recently, in January 2021, uh, this group of Studer and, um, and Tapa have uh, got the permission to conduct uh, stem cell uh, therapy in patients. So uh, they have ex vivo try to improve the quality of the stem cells using GVNF and other limban uh, proteins and uh, following injection as they saw in the animal model there was improved uh, survival and integration of the um, of the crafts so these are the summary uh, of their uh, studies it's a busy slide uh, there are some other studies which are being conducted by other uh, other companies and funding agencies this is another study which is on antisense oligonucleotide, um, which is against LARC2 induced uh, Parkinson's disease. So, this brings me to the end of uh, the academic aspects. Uh, I would like to just uh, show some of these funding agencies, the names of these funding agencies, um, which uh, support studies on Parkinson's disease and other movement disorders. Uh, these are the names of the funders and these are the societies that are involved in. So anybody who's looking for more information on this field can actually go through their websites and they have amazing information available. Uh, now, uh, this is an interesting um, story of this particular tulip, which is a special tulip which was designed or which was created um, by a Parkinson's disease uh, patient who lives in uh, Amsterdam, is van der Weral. And he was the one who created this uh, special tulip of red and white, mix of uh, red and white and is very poppy. The other, pers um, the other uh, major uh, funding agency headed by um, Michael J. Fox, that is the MJFF Foundation, uh, is the one which, uh, which um, provides maximum support to scientists, both in terms of uh, information, knowledge sharing, as well as funding. And um, what I what impresses me about him is that he says that acceptance doesn't mean resignation. It means understanding what it is and devising some ways to come out of it. So he has said that I would like to see a cure for Parkinson's disease in my lifetime. And this is a challenge for all the uh, young Parkinson's uh, disease uh, um, uh, researchers to accept this challenge and provide some relief. So I thank you for your kind attention. Um, these are the few um, members of my team who have uh, participated in all these studies. They're all my PhD scholars. 
I would also like to thank the funding agencies uh, who provided me strong financial support and my collaborators, Dr. Shankar and Dr. Anita, as well as Dr. Uday. Uh, Dr. Shankar and Dr. Anita provided me with the human brains and uh, these are my collaborators from my earlier department, Dr. Raju and Dr. Indukuti. So thank you once again. Thank you for your kind attention. Uh, thank you very much, Madam, for a very illuminating talk on Parkinson's disease. Now there is a time for questions. Uh, let us see if uh, any questions are there. Sure. Good morning, sir. Sir, Namaskara. Namaskara. Uh, Professor, I have a very layman's question. <laughs> a simple layman's uh, question. I think uh, it differs from ethnicity to ethnicity. Okay. Yes. Now, these studies are being done all over the world. Yes. I don't know whether you know, they can be, uh, there is only one way of treating, one cell therapy treating, or we have to be on our own. Because we belong to a certain ethnicity in, in the country. And is it uh, how much weightage we can give it to the other studies? Yeah, so um, that's a very interesting question. Uh, so if we look at the phenomenology of Parkinson's disease, though it may be fairly similar, uh, yeah. a clinician would explain this better, that there are differences in presentation, like in, uh, in the Caucasian population, uh, the disease onset is after 60 years, whereas in India, you see a, a, an earlier onset and a prolonged um, sustenance of the, uh, of the symptoms. So similarly, there are striatal systems, which are not, um, which are not, uh, which are not very seriously considered in the Caucasian population. So there are some uh, symptoms that are, so there is a difference in the phenomenology of the uh, cases. But as you said, uh, it is uh, one should should not give too much of importance to the ethnic aspects. Okay. As far as clinical treatment is concerned, okay. uh, my question was only to understand why an individual is more susceptible and why another is not. Yeah, that's right. Thank you, thank you, Professor. Thank you, sir. Dr. Agna, sir. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, it was a very enlightening lecture, especially for people who are not exposed to uh, this, but uh, whose relatives are probably affected by the disease. So that way, I think we are today better informed because and thanks to Dr. Balguni about this. I have only uh, two, two questions, not really questions, but uh, uh, something which I was excited about. Uh, the French and the Indian population, uh, the prevalence of the disease being so low in French and Indian population, and also Anglo Indians and Indians. Uh, without going too much into it, I was just wondering if it has got anything to do with the diet, especially the French, where they eat a lot of uh, cheese and wine. Yes. And Indians being vegetarians. Yes. Uh, is it, yes. Is it, has it got anything to do with it, madam? And uh, the second question I would like to ask you, and while I have the mic, uh, what really triggers? I mean, uh, you get, you elaborated a lot on uh, the, a number of risk factors, but uh, would like to know what is the most riskiest of all these factors, if if that is a way to put it. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. No, very interesting questions, and uh, probably will lead me into my future studies as well. Uh, so, yes, um, French and Indians, I think uh, we have certain commonalities in terms of dependence on dairy products. And uh, if they are well ripened, dairy products have a supplementary effect on the gut microbiome. So what we eat affects the gut microbiome and gut, a healthy gut microbiome keeps a healthy brain. So that kind of influences um, it influences the health of the brain. So uh, although uh, there aren't many studies in the French population on um, it's uh, probably it is not really possible to earmark uh, uh, 
certain factors, but there are a number of factors which have been uh, which have been um, uh, proposed. That includes uh, sunlight. So uh, Paris is comparatively a warm. I mean, France is comparatively a warmer country, has a Mediterranean climate all, all, also in major part of its um, geography. Uh, the second thing is yes, dairy, dairy products in their diet, and uh, probably um, their genes. So the normal aspect of genes. So my my uh, observation is that it is not about genetics. Is not only about uh, the major mutations that we talk about. It's not always about uh, genetic mutations. It is also about the normal genetic composition that we have, which may protect us. So there are so many things which we have yet not identified in terms of genes. So the normal genetic com composition. Uh, another interesting study which um, has come forward is the bilingualism that affects our brain's um, health, general health. And that has been shown in uh, Indian context as well. Uh, Professor Suvarna Aladi has shown this, that in people who speak more than one languages are better protected in terms of their cognitive aspect. One does not know whether uh, the cognitive reserve or the plasticity keeps the brain healthy in other regions as well. So that is an unexplored uh, region because we have certain uh, diet patterns. Of course, curcumin is a major uh, uh, is a major neuroprotectant that we have in our uh, armament which is probably not present in the French armament. But then they use a lot of ripened cheese, so which has the best uh, microbiota present in that uh, environment, so which probably protects. So it is the gut microbiome connection that is protecting um, these uh, the French as well as uh, Indian population. Thank you very much. Precious. Yes, sir. Two more questions, sir. What establishes the specificity of MPTP only affecting the SNPC map, or does it also affect the nuclear of basal ganglia? Yeah. So uh, MPTP, it's not only uh, involved in. Uh, uh, if we look at the studies which have been reported. Um, thus far. So the first observation was by William Langston, who saw uh, a group of uh, addicts who took some meperidine analogs and were affected and had some Parkinsonian symptoms. So that was the first uh, proof of MPTP having um, a specific effect on the basal ganglia, particularly beginning with the substantia nigra pass compactor. Now, uh, substantia nigra neurons send terminals to the putamen. Putaminal astrocytes have very high levels of monoamine oxidase B, which is an enzyme involved in the breakdown of uh, this particular um, neurotoxin. So that kind of specificity is retained in the compartments of the uh, basal ganglia, that is the uh, uh, that is the uh, striatum, motor striatum, as well as the substantia nigra pass. So, since uh, the striatum uh, uh, has astrocytes which are rich in Mao A, Mao B, sorry, Mao B, and which breaks down uh, the uh, the toxin, and because the nigral terminals are present within the striatum, nigral terminals have a better opportunity to pick up to uh, uh, receive the uh, MPP plus, which then becomes toxic to the dopaminergic neurons. I hope that explains your uh, question. Thank you very much, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And uh, one more question. Is it possible for Parkinson's to affect younger population, especially children? Yes, and what would be the risk factor if in that case? Uh, young onset Parkinson's disease case, uh, patients are known. So are juvenile cases. There is a, a huge team working from Japan on the juvenile cases and they have beautiful uh, papers which i can share with you later and uh, young onset parkinson's disease cases are also um, uh, very prominently seen in our indian um, cohorts in our indian uh, context and um, 
they are generally associated with uh, genetic onset of the disease. So if there is a genetic mutation, the um, on disease onset or the symptom onset is likely to uh, proceed by a few years. Thank you very much, ma'am. The last question is, uh, is there any commonality or relationship between Alzheimer and Par Parkinson's, ma'am? Yeah, that's a very interesting question again. So the, um, if you see the um, phenomenology of Parkinson's disease and its associated disorders, Parkinson's disease, as we saw, is, um, is known as a movement disorder or a motor disorder because the motor symptoms become dominant at a certain stage. However, in certain cases, certain patients have cognitive deficits before the onset of the motor deficits, okay? And most of the cases, I think 30 to 40% of the Parkinson's disease case patients go on to develop cognitive symptoms after the onset of, after uh, one or two years of the onset of the motor symptoms. And it is believed that there could be a similarity in the cognitive manifestation that is seen in Alzheimer's disease as well as the cognitive uh, similar uh, manifestation in Parkinson's disease. So there are um, uh, papers which hypothesize that the cognitive deficits seen in Parkinson's disease may have an Alzheimer's-like uh, origin. So there are uh, possibilities that uh, there is a similarity and connect connectivity, I mean, you know, commonality between the two and one could lead to the um, other disease, yes. Because uh, if you look at, uh, if you look at the gait associated symptoms in Parkinson's disease, it is believed that uh, the initiation is not only because of the deficiency in the dopamine, but also because of the uh, motivation associated uh, neurotransmitters. And lack of motivation is a major uh, symptom in Alzheimer's disease. So there are commonalities, yes. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, Ramesh, sir, over to you, sir. Uh, madam, I have a question. Is there any correlation between Parkinson's disease and stress and uh, past injury? Stress. Yes. Yes, uh, there are uh, uh, there are uh, recent times, I think in last one decade or so, uh, stress has received its uh, due importance in terms of Parkinson's disease pathology. People. Uh, do say that there is an increased uh, incidence in individuals who are high, uh, highly stressed. Um, other instance is of stroke, so comorbidities, you know, comorbid conditions. So stroke is generally associated with uh, low, um, uh, low motivation, right, reduced motivation. So that has also uh, been noted to be a comorbid condition for Parkinson's disease. Yes. Madam, my second question, is there any effective Ayurvedic treatment for Parkinson's disease? Indeed. Uh, if you uh, remember, the first slide which I showed was about uh, our uh, Maharshi Charaka and his Charaka Samhita. And uh, since uh, I think 5,000 years in Indian literature, in Ayurveda, uh, um, it has been mentioned that um, the cowhage bean, that right, mucuna prurians, is effective in taking care of the uh, motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. In Ayurveda, it has also been shown to uh, be effective in uh, cognitive deficits uh, present in uh, with Parkinson's disease or without Parkinson's disease also. So when used in uh, in um, uh, in conjunction with Sida cordifolia. It can rescue the motor uh, the motor as well as the cognitive symptoms. So now there is an uh, international uh, uh, clinical trial which is going on, and uh, that is taking care of uh, these aspects. So that is, uh, and they show a tremendous improvement in the UPDRS scores. So yes, Ayurvedic formulations are very useful, but they should be provided under the care of a physician, Ayurvedic physician should not be taken off the shelf because in Western countries, people have seen that, you know, uh, because mucuna prurians is so effective in Parkinson's disease, people just buy it off the shelf and eat it. And there could be adverse uh, 
um, reactions, adverse effects. So those things have to be taken care of. So thank you very much, madam. We have sure. listened to a very scholastic and informative talk on Parkinson's disease by distinguished scientist of NIMHANS, Dr. Albumi Anand, madam. Uh, your talk gave a very good overview of Parkinson's disease, which covered history of the disease, right from reference to Ayurveda, Chinese, and these texts, texts, then definition of Parkinson's disease, disease manifestation, effect on olfaction, epidemiology, genetics, neuropathology, biomarkers, and clinical trials, etc. And also, you uh, talked about recent uh, research trends in Parkinson's disease. In fact, uh, it is a very, very informative and uh, useful talk for all the participants present. On behalf of all those who are present and also on behalf of PSTA, I thank you uh, very, uh, very much for his, this very enlightening talk, madam. Thank you very much. I am thankful to our Honorable Chairman, Professor S. I. Appan, for getting us in organizing these uh, type of programs. I would like to thank immensely our esteemed members of uh, KSTA, Professor B. G. Munimani, sir, and Dr. A. E. Eknath, sir, for their presence and constant support. You have been there with us, sir, in all the webinars. We, we look up to you for your guidance and support. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, we have with us uh, I am also grateful to Dr. Bharat Srinivas, Professor and Head Department of Clinical Psychopharmacology and Neurotoxicology for connecting us with the experts of months and I am thankful to him. And I acknowledge the presence of uh, very senior academicians and uh, researchers on this uh, occasion. We have with uh, us Dr. Rukmani, Madam, who will be delivering a talk uh, next week on uh, 17th of uh, this month on uh, nano medicines. Thank you for your presence, madam. We have with us Dr. Professor P.M. Patil, Dr. Abhishek, Dr. Gayatri Sudhir, Dr. Priya, Dr. Tabassam, Dr. Lakshmi Khan, Dr. Nagamani, Dr. Alakananda, and Dr. Kavya, and all their uh, most of their uh, PG students have joined. Thank you very much for your support and uh, thankful to the participants. Next week, we have three distinguished talks on 14th July. Uh, that's on Wednesday. We have a talk by Padma Bhushan, Dr. B. N. Suresh, Chancellor of IISD. So he is a space scientist. He'll be a he will be delivering a talk on why is it rocket science. After that, on July 15th, we have a talk by uh, that's on Thursday by Dr. Sharada Subramanian, Professor, Department of Neurochemistry, Nimans. She will be talking on the aging of uh, brain. After that, on July 17th, Dr. Rukmani Nambal, Madam, will be delivering a talk on nanotechnology, nanomedicine. I, re I request all the participants to join these talks also. We require your encouragement and support for organizing programs like this, which are very beneficial to your own research and broadening your own horizon of uh, knowledge. Thank you very much for your uh, kind attention and being with us. Thank you very much. Have a great day and be safe.